Good evening or good morning, everybody, wherever you are in the world. This project that I'm going to present at the desk today is something very close to me. And since it started at Oxford, I think it's only fair that I should come back and present it and tell what I consider my archaeological family about it. So the topic that I'm going to talk about tonight is temples as a tool for negotiating identity and establishing power, a case study of the Gurjar Pratihara dynasty of North India. This was carried out as a speaking archaeologically research project. It was so far the most ambitious project that we've had at speaking archaeologically. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what speaking archaeologically is before I sort of move on to talk about what this talk is all about. So speaking archaeologically, like you've already been told, is an archaeological education group which is based in North India, which is where I am at the present moment. And it focuses on object analysis as well as documentation of neglected and forgotten sites. One of our chief aims at speaking archaeologically is rescue archaeology, a branch that doesn't get a lot of attention worldwide. We're working continuously with encroached sites, neglected sites, sites that are particularly vulnerable because of developmental strategies and issues all over the world. It was founded in 2015 by yours truly. And in the six years of its existence since then, we've proudly produced and trained young archaeologists, anthropologists, conservators, and art historians who are actively taking the torch forward. And I'm very proud that a lot of you have joined in from among my students here tonight. Thank you so much for being here. It means so much to me. So uh, moving on. So about this project, the project that led me to sort of research more about the Gurjar Pratihars actually started with this dilapidated site that you see on the screen to your right. Uh, it's the site of Bhima Devi Temple Pinjor, which is located in northern India in the state of Haryana. It's right to the north of Haryana. And what started off effectively at this site turned into a massive documentation project looking to all the Gurjar Pratihara temples, which we have all over North India. The main objectives of this project, which was primarily centered around this site, then snowballed into uh, geographically reviewing the location of the Pratihara temples, specifically Bhima Devi, but also the other temples or also the other sister sites by the same dynasty. Uh, we then went on to analyze what their economic significance might have been, especially with respect to their proximity to existing trade routes. Another objective that we had was to study the origin of Panchyatna temples. As you will see later in the talk tonight, uh, the Panchyatna temple flow plan is very unique to this particular time frame, so 9th to 11th century, roughly 8th to 11th century, if I have to be precise. And it is this dynasty that brings up this new plan of temple architecture. It wasn't existing before this. So we started to look into what the Panchyatna temple flow plan is like, and we also wanted to investigate how exactly did it originate? What was the reason for choosing this particular new layout? And also we wanted to examine whether or not building shrines had a political rationale behind it, akin to the Western concept of enlightened monarchy or the divine right to rule. We also wanted to understand the nuances of Indian architecture, especially with respect to the Vastu texts, as well as the Shilp Shastras, and examine how they were employed in temple architecture, as well as ascertain whether a reconstruction of Bhima Devi temple is possible with measurement systems and specifications of the ancient texts. We also wanted to understand the development of Shaivism and Shaivite sculptures, particularly iconography, because I come from the object analysis background, back from my days in Oxford. So iconography has been of particular interest to me, specifically with respect to sculptures. So I wanted to sort of see how Shiva, who is this composite deity, combining a lot of features of indigenous tribal deities that existed before mainstream Hinduism took over. I wanted to understand how these cultures came into being, but that's another talk for another time. I wanted to also look into emergence and growth as well as development of Indian sculpture and analyze various theories in it. So these were particularly my personal goals with this project. As a team, we also wanted to look at temples as tools for religious unification under the Samartha Brahmin tradition, which I'm going to talk about in a while. And we wanted to understand the influence of native and tribal cults on Hinduism and Hindu art. For this, we also looked into concepts such as Panchyatna Puja, which is different from the Panchyatna temple, the concept of Tantra, 
and its association with Panchayatna shrines and their art. We also wanted to look into the future scope of such sites, sites like the one that you see on your right, with respect to archaeology, with respect to tourism, and with respect to their legacy in art and civilization, because like I said, our organization primarily revolves around the concept of rescue archaeology. So, Let's talk about the purpose of the talk tonight. So the purpose here is to examine the origin of the Pratihars and to study how constructing a temple served as a tool to negotiate identity and establish power in a religiously and socially divided society, which is predominantly what the society was like between the 8th to the 13th century in India. And our little dynasty here falls right into that. So before we move on further, I think it becomes pertinent to address who the Gurjar Pratihars are because context as we all know, and as I was told several times at Oxford, is imperative to all archaeology. So if you see the map on the screen here, you will realize that Gurjur Pratihars were actually one of the predominant dynasties in northern India in this period between 8 to about the 11th and in some cases even the 13th century. They were one of the first four patrilineal clans of a caste group referred to as the Rajputs. And this was an emergent class group. Now, those of you who are new to caste groups in India, there are predominantly four castes in India. The Brahmins, who are the priests. The Kshatriyas, who are the warriors. The Vaishyas, who are the tradesmen or merchants. And the Shudras, who are basically involved with all menial jobs as per the Vedas. When I say menial, though, I do mean things like leathersmiths or uh, metal metal workers, all of them are also classified into that. Even weavers, for that matter, are a menial class group. The Rajputs, however, were none of these. So there are an emergent caste group in this particular scenario, which is what triggered off my interest in who were the Rajputs and what exactly is the story behind this fifth new caste that emerges around this time. And why is it exactly that they get the right to rule over the Kshatriyas, who were the existing warriors or the ruling class? So we're looking at the map at close quarters now. If you notice, the Gurjur Patihar Empire stretches all the way from Western India to some of the higher altitudes in the north and all the way to the east. So at the northernmost point, they reached the periphery of the modern day Kashmir. At the westernmost front, they had almost all of Gujarat, as well as the modern areas of Rajasthan. They were also a part of the, of the eastern edge of Pakistan. And then they go all the way to Bengal before they get fragmented around the 9th century and their feudatories declare themselves independent. So this brings us to the topic as to who were the Pratehars exactly. And one of the first things that I started to do was look at ancient Indian historiography and literature. So what exactly was written about them and then who exactly they were. So one of the earliest theories about their origins was retrieved from uh, literary sources uh, is called the Agni Kul myth. And it is, I mean, it is to my mind at least, quite a theory akin to Game of Thrones, where the Rajputs are nothing but an ancient term for Daenerys Targaryen who emerged out of fire. So as the, as the story goes, uh, all the Kshatriyas were rendered inca incapacitated to take care of everybody else. Uh, the, the clans were warring among themselves and the Kshatriyas were not in a position to protect the other people. So at this point of time, the Brahmins or the priests sit down at a place in Mount Abu in Rajasthan and perform a huge fire sacrifice and from that sacrifice from that fire sacrifice or the altar emerges a figure much like Daenerys and comes out to protect the Brahmins and the other castes from the tyrannical rules of the Kshatriyas. Now this story comes from a source called the Navshashank Charit which was written by a man called Padmagupt who was the court poet of the Paramar rulers. The Paramars were feudatories of the Gurjar Pratihars and they eventually declared themselves independent and went on to establish their own dynasty in North India much later on in history. However, 
the origin of Rajputs is attributed by Padma Gupta to a man who is identified as Gurjar Pratihar. So Gurjar Pratihar is a term used for the father of the Rajput clans, all of the Rajput clans. So technically, all Rajputs then emerge from a man called Gurjar Pratihar, who is the founding father of this particular clan, right? And of course, there's this whole fireborn figure uh, image attached to this man. You find this uh, myth in different sources among different Rajput dynasties subsequently, but the, the premise remains the same, which is being born out of the fire altar. Now, all of this is very fantastic if you have to sort of look at it from the literary point of view. But being an archaeologist, I wasn't really satisfied with that theory. So we went on digging a little bit and looking into what exactly was the history behind it. And that led us to a, a town called Mandavipur or modern day Mandor, which is also located in the state of Rajasthan in the west in a place called Jodhpur. It's nearly 373 miles to the southwest of New Delhi, which is the national capital. And the town is archaeologically known for 6th century family inscriptions, which are supposedly associated with the Gurjar Pratihars. Now, one of these inscriptions clearly state that the dynasty of the Gurjar Pratihars was founded by an offspring of a Brahmin named Hari Chandra and his Kshatriya wife named Bhadra or Bhadrika. And interesting as it was to all of us, this inscription was deciphered as early as 1906 by a prominent historian called R.D. Bhandarkar, who was also a part of the Archaeological Survey of India. Now, probably because of the large body of text that this man went on to write in his life, or probably because this wasn't in tandem with nationalistic sentiments also brewing in the country at that time, this theory or this story or this inscription itself and its translation was lost. So if you pick up any modern day history books, you are going to find that there is no origin of Rajputs as such archaeologically verifiable, which wasn't the case. The, the sources always existed, only you needed to sort of find them out, look at them and also study the inscriptions. Recently, however, around 2017, which is when we started this project, a professor called Dr. Shantarani Sharma actually unearthed these inscriptions again, but she didn't quite get the impetus that she was supposed to get with this uh, with this research. Also, another problem with the Gurjar Pratihars in general is they're generally left out from the from the history of India. So whenever you're reading ancient India or early medieval India, which specifically this period is, you wouldn't find a lot of sources mentioning them. Rather, the only mention that they find in textual sources is with respect to the Agnikul theory. So it's just that theory. It has that name and that's the end of it. Not a lot was being done archaeologically with respect to the Pratihars or historically with help of the Pratihar, uh, with respect to the Pratihars. And eventually all their history as well as their contribution to art was lost to time. So interestingly, when you look at these inscriptions that I'm talking about, the Pratihars also tend to trace their descent from the family of Lakshman, who's the younger half brother of Ram, who's the hero of the Indian epic Ramayan. This claim is most commonly repeated in almost all Gurjar Pratihar inscriptions, and also notably in the work of a certain Raj Shekhar, who wrote two books called Vidyushal Bhanjika and Bal Bharat. And he was the court poet of the two predominant Pratihar kings, Mahendrapal and his son Mahipal. It is this theory which was replaced by the Agnikul theory in the 11th century. So up until the 11th century, they always claimed to be descendants of Lakshman from the Ikshavaku clan. And then suddenly you have the Agnikul theory coming in the 11th century, which replaces all trace of this. That may be another reason why nobody really looked into this particular inscription or what it said. So this brings us to the conclusion that the Agnikul myth was a later addition to the epigraphic tales of the Pratihar origins. Let's now talk about temples and the Pratihars. So around the time that the Gurjar Pratihars were slowly gaining uh, impetus in North India, starting from Rajasthan and then going on to conquer almost all parts of North India and con continuing towards the east, 
a new temple architecture style starts emerging, which is the Panchyatna style. Now, the diagram would show you what exactly I mean by Panchyatna in, uh, in a small way. It is the temple architecture that is, is centered around the belief that the temple is housed in the body of a woman, which is why the sanctum sanctorum of the temple is known as Garbhagrihe or the womb house. And anatomically, it would be located exactly where the uterus of a woman would be. And that's exactly what the temple looks like. It has at least four shrines, but sometimes also one huge shrine. It is surrounded by four subsidiary shrines. And that is arranged in a quincunx pattern. Some of the first examples of such temples can be still found in lower Shivalik area. And if you sort of date them, they can be they're synchronous to the times of Gurjur Pratihars. In fact, a lot of these temples are attributed directly to the Pratihar kings because inscriptions mention which ruler got this temple commissioned. So this is what I mean by the quincunx pattern of worship here. Predominantly, you have the deities arranged in the same pattern as you would see on a die. So the main shrine is in the center, and this would be dedicated to the main deity that you're dedicating your temple to. The subsidiary shrines on the side, which are four in number, are dedicated to any other four deities. These can be related to the parent deity because in the Hindu mythology, you do have a chain of fathers and sons being worshipped, same as the Greek mythology. So the main shrine can have relationship to the subsidiary shrine in, in case of being married to one of the deities or being the father of the other deity. But equally so, you could have arbitrary deities located in the subsidiary shrine bearing no relationship to the main deity. We also sort of investigated a little more into it and found that a lot of times the shrines behind would be dedicated to the Vedic gods and not the Puranic gods, whereas the shrines in the front would predominantly have Puranic gods. So a word or two about Vedic and Puranic Hinduism. Vedic Hinduism is something that we get from our four Vedas, and it's more akin to the religion in the Zend Avesta. So it has a lot of parallelisms with the Zend Avestan religion, whereas the Puranic Hinduism has a lot in common with the religion of the Bactrians, who we call the Indo-Greeks in my part. And it is predominantly with interaction with these that we start getting a pantheon very similar to the Greek or Roman pantheon, also gods with very similar characteristics as the, as the Greek gods. And around the fourth and the fifth century, what we had predominantly going on in the religious sphere was the Vedic Hinduism fighting with Puranic Hinduism to establish its supremacy, equally so, we had Jainism and Buddhism vying for supremacy, and we might have the Mauryas to blame for it. So the Mauryan dynasty that comes into power right after Alexander's invasion, somewhere around 3rd century BCE, and lasts about 1st century BCE, started this horrible trend where the king would patronize a religion and consequently give you grants, give you right to collect taxes in a particular village. So if the king was in favor of your religion, you had a lot of political sway. This somehow became a trend in North India. So you found subsequent dynasties doing just the same. And as a result, the religions were continuously vying with each other for the favor of the king. At the same time also, caste system becomes very, very rigid with subsequent dynasties precisely because of this. So if you were worshiping a particular religion, you were considered as an outcast by the other. And at this point of time, around the fifth and the sixth century, you have Another set of priests emerging known as the Samartha Brahmins who try to unify these buying religions and try to preach this message of universal brotherhood where all religions should be treated equally. Now, interestingly for us, we observed that the Panchyatna temples of the Gurjur Pratihars, which were built on the Panchyatna diagram or the Panchyatna Puja Mandal pattern, uh, they started incorporating deities from all these vying religions. So you might have a temple which will also have Jain and Buddhist elements to it. There might even be a subsidiary shrine dedicated to Buddha or at least Buddha on the outer walls of a, of a subsidiary shrine. And you could clearly see that the Gurjur Pratihars, or at least their policy, their underlying philosophy below beneath building these temples was unifying all vying religions. They also 
built a lot of temples. So wherever they would conquer a new area, they would build a temple there. Every time they went on to invade a new territory, there would be a Panchayatna temple there. So a little more into the Pratihar temples then, once they start expanding as a political and imperial power, specifically under Nagabhatta II, they undertook a massive construction of temples in every new area that they acquired. This construction process became so widespread that the Gurjir Pratihara temples can be studied with respect to the different phases of architecture. The predominantly three phases that you see in the table here, Phase one starts around 725 CE, and this is a period of exper experimentation. So when you look at the floor plans, they are all over the place. Some of them are square, some of them are rectangular, some of them are very, very similar to the Gupta temples because temple architecture, specifically in Hinduism, starts with the Gupta dynasty, which was quite a time before the Gurjur Pratihars came into power. The second phase or the middle phase starts around the 8th century, and here you see a gradual development of rectangular floor plans and projections of square mandap. This is also the time that the Quin Kangs pattern of deity worship is incorporated into temple floor plan. The last phase is again all over the place because this is the time that the Gurjar Pratihars are losing currency in terms of a political power. The feudatories are declaring themselves independent. So you find a lot of floor plans with very little variation, but they're eventually shifting to a circular plan. You see almost the end of the Panchayatna style, which was very, very prominent around the end of the initial phase and the beginning of the middle phase. So why did the Pratihars construct temples on such a large scale exactly? Religious fervor? Highly unlikely. Love for construction? Apparently not. I think I have already given out most of the meat here, but well, they did construct temples on a large scale because the early medieval society was highly caste ridden, where power was centralized with the ruling clans, in this case, the Kshatriyas, who were backed up by the priests or the Brahmins. So if you were an emergent class or an emergent caste, all you needed to start with was negotiating your own identity and then ensuring that the priests backed you up so that you could establish your authority to rule and the people wouldn't look at you as an outsider. One of the main problems with the Gurjar Pratihars is their father was a Brahmin and their mother was a Kshatriya, which if you went by the standards back then, rendered them illegitimate. So they could neither be considered Brahmins nor be considered the Kshatriyas, which is why the whole fabrication about the Kshatriyas have lost the currency to rule and somebody needs to come along to protect the classes and who better to do it than an offspring of a Brahmin and a Kshatriya combined together. So they literally turn the tables around for themselves and go on from becoming illegitimate people to actually legitimate rulers. Some of the harshest critics of the Gurjar Pratihars are the Rashtrakuta Kshatriyas, who at that time would even refer to them with derogatory terms such as Dwarpal or the keepers of the gates. So that's how much they were hated. Indeed, some of the most uh, violent wars in this time were fought by the Pratihars against the Kshatriya clans like Rashtrakutas at this particular period, specifically around central India. So what better way to negotiate your identity than building a temple and getting all the priests on your side at the same time, at once appeasing the Vedic, the Puranic, the Buddhist and the Jain priests by constructing a temple which would combine features from all these religions. So this was a power move. It was a it was a calculated risk that they took. It was a strategy of their times and it was necessary because constructing temples would have strengthened their relationship with the priesthood. The priests would have further supported and legitimized their claim to rule and consequently authored the kind of inscriptions and the kind of stories that we find eventually in their texts. Incorporation of new practices would have, established, would have established the rulers as custodians of moral and social well-being, as well as the persons responsible for the spiritual upliftment of their subjects. And temple construction was a calculated and deliberate undertaking in accordance, in accordance to ancient Indian straight craft treatise like the Arthashastra, which actually tells you 
as early as the 3rd century BCE to build temples to ensure political power, to strengthen economy and also gain popular support in a socially rigid environment. So none of this was religious fervor or a, a pensions for constructing buildings whatsoever. So what did we do at Speaking Archaeologically? Well, at Speaking Archaeologically, we studied over 20 such temple sites, beginning with the Bhima Devi, uh, beginning with the Bhima Devi Temple, and then moving further northwards, westwards, and eastwards. We studied these sites with relation to their parallels built by later dynasties. We also looked at the temples which were built by the feudatories and the chiefs of the Pratihars. And we also looked at the declining temples. This project started individually in 2015. So I sort of started looking around these temples around 2015 myself, and then collectively with my team around 2017. It lasted until December 2019. So we compiled everything that we found into primary reports and later a book that discussed the structure, science, religion, philosophy, archaeology, history and architecture of these temples and why exactly were they built for what they were. We also photographed, documented and recorded the most vulnerable of these sites. We are, as we speak, still in process of taking in more sites, but unfortunately due to the COVID outbreak, we had to sort of rest our activity in December 2019. But despite that, we recently published our report and findings for whatever we know so far in the Speaking Archaeologically Journal, Volume 3. And we are very, very proud of this journal, which I will also hold to the screen right now. So with that, it brings me to the end of my talk. And I think right in time, because we will then have half an hour for questions and answers. So once again, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to everybody at Oxford Centre for Asian Archaeology, Art and Culture for giving me this opportunity to speak about a project that means so much to me personally, and that technically started somewhere around my time in Oxford. I'd like to also thank my co-editor and partner in crime, the Vyansh Thakur, who's here with us tonight, and our talented chief illustrator, Siddharth Ayer, without whom we would not have had the fabulous diagrams that we have in the book, I'd like to thank our cartography and temple plans expert, Priyanshu Mehta, who's also here tonight, and our principal photographer, Manish Sharma, our proofreading team, the Tarak Datta and Simran Saini, and all the wonderful people who helped us survey these sites at such an amazing level all through India, because whenever it was physically impossible to go somewhere or arrange a stay somewhere or probably a preliminary investigation somewhere, all these students really came to my rescue. So thank you, everybody. And here is a list of selected bibliography, which talks about where all these sources come from in this paper. So with respect to this paper in general and the project in particular, this is all we've read, but there's certainly much more.